today on Soul Work for Moms. I don't know about you, but when someone says, be present or be conscious to me, it usually doesn't even mean anything to me because I'm not really sure what they're even talking about. Do you mean pay attention? Do you mean don't judge? Do you even know what you mean when you say that? Today's guest does an amazing job breaking down how she defines being present and conscious, and she wants to help you do just that. Anne-Marie Cherezzo supports parents, educators, and students who are willing to take responsibility for creating exquisite and fulfilling relationships and lives. Anne-Marie offers one-on-one coaching, family coaching, teaches mindfulness and conscious leadership in schools, hosts events, leads online courses, and speaks to groups about the importance of mindfulness, consciousness, and presence. First and foremost a parent, Anne-Marie has spent the past 18 years perfecting the art of parenting imperfectly while balancing her crazy life. She understands that the most valuable tool that we have is presence. She masterfully guides parents, educators, and children to help cultivate presence and unconditional love in all their moments. Anne-Marie lives in Chicago with her partner and their blended family of five children. And you can hear Anne-Marie's advice on how you can be more present and how you can be more conscious in your relationship with your children. And hear a free offer from Anne-Marie on learning how to work with your anger and your child's anger right after this. I'm Michelle Duncan Wilson, and last year I created a workshop for moms to get together and work through some of the things they were struggling with. The feedback from the workshop was great, but the thing I heard over and over again from the mothers was that they loved hearing all the other women who shared their struggles and strengths in mothering. I wanted to create an outlet for more of that, and the result is this podcast. Join me as I interview a different mother every week. You can listen in as women from all different backgrounds and stages in life share their experiences in motherhood. You'll also hear from expert guests who share their ideas on how to take the hard parts of mothering and use them to grow personally and spiritually. I call it Soul Work for Moms, Evolution Through Mothering. Welcome to the show. Anne-Marie, thanks so much for being on the show today. Mm, Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited you're here. So I first met you at an event of yours in Chicago. I had read Shafali Sabari's book, The Conscious Parent. I loved that book. I really resonated with her message and later saw that she was going to be speaking in Chicago at a Conscious Parenting Summit. Um, Mm -hmm. She was kind of headlining the event and there were breakout sessions that you could choose from during the day. So not only were you the one that put that event together, but you also led a session and it just so happened to be one of the sessions that my husband and I picked. And I think it was around handling your anger in parenting. And it was an awesome session. And it really centered around feeling your feelings all the way to the end. We're going to get into all of that. But first, what is conscious parenting? Hmm. Okay. Big question. You know, I'd like to start with the polarity of which is, you know, what's unconscious parenting, right? So unconscious simply means this idea that we're unconscious, we're not awake, we're not aware. And it's neither good nor bad. It just is, is an isness of an experience in the moment. So if we're saying unconscious is being unaware or not awake, simply this idea of being in conscious relationship to our children or a conscious parent means that we're fully awake to what is occurring. We're present. So all relationships are a reflection of something that's going on inside ourselves that I would argue is either guiding us towards love or towards fear or healing, um, which is, you know, love and healing or fear and healing. So a conscious relationship is one that's waking us up to those places within us that are seeking one of those two things in any given moment. So when we notice triggers 
in those in our children, right, that we're in relationship to, we can choose to look at those triggers as a source of a problem. So we can look at like, you know, my child doing this and that's a problem, which so many of us do, and that's fine. Or we can look at it as like, what is wanting to be healed in me through this mirror? So a conscious relationship is one in which we're using the the relationship to our child to be awake to the mirror that they are for us. Okay. And what are we missing out on then? What are our children missing out on if we aren't cultivating a conscious relationship with them? What I think they're missing out on is the opportunity to then see themselves as a whole being and be able to use us as um, as a place for their own growth and expansion. So when we get in the way, they are seeing that reflection, which is what I would call our shadow versus our essence. When they're seeing that, they can't then see themselves. We're not reflecting back. It's like looking into a pond that's murky. If the pond isn't clear, you can't see your reflection. So if our children are in relationship to us and we're not a clear reflection back to them, they're actually not seeing their essence or their true selves. Because it's too muddled up with with our own stuff that we're putting on them. Yes, we're getting in the way. We're clouding it up. They're, it's too noisy. It's too loud. It's too dark. They can't see themselves through that. And is that the same thing as presence? Would you use those two words interchangeably, being conscious and being present? I do. I use those words uh, interchangeably. I think they're the same thing. So when you're conscious, you're just present. You're fully aware to all that is present in the moment. Okay, because it seems like nowadays that word presence, it's just getting used so much that it almost doesn't even mean anything anymore. Like, yeah, Uh yeah, I'm present, I'm present. So um, I think that's a good explanation of what presence is. Yeah, it's the same same thing with the word conscious. That's getting flown around too. And all these words, mindful, conscious, presence, they're losing their their meaning, which is why I like to really take them apart and um, look at them really closely. Because presence... It took me a long time to understand what presence was. Um, I studied it. I taught it. um, But to really get with what presence is on an embodiment level, it took me a long, long time. And I would even go further to say presence is the experience of unconditional love. So being in the presence of the essence of who you are, which is unconditional love. Mm, That's beautiful. So presence is more than just not looking at your phone when you're with someone. (laughs) Right. Right. Yeah. 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 I'm here. I'm right here. I'm right here. Right. (laughs) But how are you being here is what we're asking from where are you being? That's, that's what we're talking about when we're talking about being conscious or present. Yeah. And so you mentioned unconditional love. And I think that unconditional love is something that we all deep down inside have for our children. And I think it's really, it can be difficult to put into practice because we have these ideas when we have children of who they're going to be or who we are going to be. And a lot of times it doesn't end up working out that way. Uh, Can you talk about that and that relationship to that unconditional love and presence that, that we're speaking of? Yeah, so I would say unconditional love is being unattached to any outcome or idea of who you think your children should or shouldn't be. So unconditional love is is acceptance. It's pure acceptance of whatever it is um, that they are and how it is that they're showing up in the moment and loving that. So that means if my child is showing up in a way um, that isn't necessarily pleasing to me or isn't what I desire or isn't what I've imagined, I'm loving them right there in that. Um, And that is, I think, our greatest challenge, clearly in relationship to our children, because we have so many expectations of them, Um, but in all relationships, really. But our children bring it out in us so greatly because we have 
such attachment to who they are and who they're becoming. And they're, we're, we're, we're in relationship to our children from our ego so much that mm-hmm. it's hard, hard to get that ego out of the way and even be aware of when the ego's getting in the way. For instance, we love to parent from this place of, oh, well, I know what's best for them. You know, they, they, they should do this or that because it's, it's best for them. I know what's best for them. And what's true is we actually don't know what's best for them. What's best for them is for us to get out of the way so that they can find out what's best for them and for us to trust that they know what's best for them. <laughs> does that make sense? I feel like I just talked in circles. <laughs> no, it, it does make sense. And so let's, let's take maybe a specific example. Um, this one's kind of easy, but we'll just take it through just to show what you're talking about. I think it's best for my daughter to keep her room clean. Mm. Oh my gosh, I just had this argument with my daughter this morning. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so why? Why do you think it's best for her? What, what's it going to do for her? Um, so this one actually doesn't really bother me anymore, but I'll just play the devil's advocate here. And I'd say because she needs to learn responsibility and she needs to learn that other people aren't going to clean up after her. And she needs to learn good hygiene, that you don't leave dishes in your room and that you're better set up for life if you're organized and cleaning as you go. Right. So these are thoughts we, we have all of the time that somehow, um, Love is teaching our kids what being a good human being is or um, what being responsible is or how, how to take care of yourself. And and it's not that those things aren't true. It's that somehow or another, on some level, we're not trusting that that's getting, that message is getting delivered to them just by our by our own being. So in other, in other words, when I went upstairs to my daughter's room this morning, it, it, her room was a disaster, a complete disaster. And she's, she's actually really organized and really together. Um, and I noticed those thoughts in my mind, like, like I, I don't, she's going to be a mess when she grows up and just all that stuff coming through my head. And I got really present. I was like, that is actually not true. I'm just in a state of fear, and albeit one of these crazy little fears that um, are driving me to control my daughter and her room, which is really just creating irritation and disconnection between myself and my daughter. Um, and she said to me, why does it matter if my clothes are piled on the floor? And I finally said to her, it really doesn't. It's just that I want it to look a certain way. And I I completely just owned that piece. So I really got present with her room being a mess has nothing to do with who she is as a human being or how she's going to grow up or who she's going to turn out to be. Um, I don't have to be in any state of fear, quote unquote fear, because that's really what it boils down to, this fear that we're not doing something. Um, And I could just own that I want her room to look a certain way and I could just be with that. You know, that, that's, that's presence. That's just owning it at its core. And then it gets a little trickier, though, as you get into some more um, serious, more permanent type situations like children's grades or ACT scores or college applications. Gosh, I mean, the list goes on and on. Driving, teen pregnancy. So I think there's a, a tendency for people to go black or white and say you should either accept that you're teen may end up getting pregnant or you're not loving them. And so where is that line, Anne-Marie, of, of supporting your teen, teaching them, helping them prevent from mistakes that they may not be able to see and that presence? Do you follow what I'm saying? I totally get this. Um, here's what I have to say about that. The world is not black and white. It's gray. And we live in the, this idea of polarities, good, bad, right, wrong. And we live in this idea that we as the parent know better. We know that I'll go to the really extreme example that you presented a second ago, which is my daughter shouldn't get pregnant as a teenager. Now, what's true is we have a desire for a particular outcome for our children. 
But we actually don't know that anything that we desire for them is what's really in their best interest. We don't know what it is that they're being called to learn and how every experience in their life is shaping who they will become and what they need. And so when we get in the way, we're interfering with their learning. And the more we interfere with it, the more it's going to show up until that lesson gets learned. So for instance, um, I have a 17 year old son who has lessons to learn. And I see, you know, I've gotten in the way of him learning to take responsibility for himself, for instance, because I keep stepping in and protecting him, you know, and, and, and taking his power away from him. So, you know, as I step away, I notice that he is more and more empowered and taking more and more control of his life. And that's been a hard lesson for me to learn because I can so, I so know what the outcome is. It's like, it's like a recipe, right? Yeah. You know, when you put flour and sugar and vanilla and brown sugar, I'm forgetting all the cookie, (laughs) all the ingredients, but you know, when you put all that stuff together and you put it in the oven, you're going to get a chocolate chip cookie out in the end. And when you watch your kids do things, you know, when they're doing, you know, a certain set of behaviors that there's going to be a certain outcome. And so you try and tell them, but they have to figure it out for themselves. That's, that's how they learn. That's how they learn to navigate life. So we, we can get in the way of their own learning. And until we're willing and courageous enough to step out of the way, um, we're actually disempowering them. All right. So I'm going to follow this teen pregnancy one through to the end, just to make the point. So we suspect maybe that our teen is engaging in sexual activity and we're worried about the teen pregnancy. I don't hear you saying don't do anything about that because that is just her path. No, that's not what I'm saying. (laughs) No, 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 no. So in that instance, what is that balance of not knowing what is best for her and not putting our fear on her? Right. So our first job is to get with our fear and really get very clear about what our fears are. So they can go all the way from, I don't want her to have this life to, I don't want people thinking I'm a bad parent because my daughter's pregnant or whatever. So get really clear about all the stuff that's going on in you and make sure we're not parenting from that place. So our job is really to be a guide, to shine the light for our children. So um, in that case, you, what you do as the parent is you point everything out. This is, this is a consequence of these behaviors. Have you thought about this? I don't want this for you. Here's why I don't want this for you. Um, this is what my suggestion is. This is why I want this for you. And you share with them really from your heart And I think that's the most effective thing we could do. Like, wow, I I noticed myself feeling really scared about this idea of you getting pregnant when you're 17. This is what I see happening. This is what I know from my own life experience and really sharing. So you're connecting with them from a place of vulnerability and authenticity, not from a place of fear, like you're bad, you're going to ruin your life. This is a horrible thing all of that stuff, that's not someplace they're going to really hear you from. So when you can um, outline it all, create boundaries to the best of your ability, like this is what's acceptable in my home, this is what's acceptable in our lives, this is the behavior that I expect you to have, um, then they're going to make their own decision no matter what no matter what we say or do, our children are making their own decisions. So, you know, I, what I would say is, um, give them as much information from a loving heart centered place as possible, and then let go and trust. And that is conscious parenting. I think so. Yeah. And it's extraordinarily brave and it's extraordinarily courageous because you have to be okay with what, with the outcome, with the choices that they make and support them there. And this comes back to, you know, that presence piece. Okay, well, 
she's pregnant. Now what? Mm -hmm. Now what do I do? And yeah. Well, and I can't remember where I heard this this week, if it was a podcast or I read it on Facebook, but someone was saying that if we, the earlier that we can start doing this and letting our children take responsibility for themselves, the stronger they will be at being able to do that, to take responsibility. Otherwise, if we are doing everything and forcing everything and keeping them in this safe container, and then we open the cage and let them out into the world, they've had no practice. They have no guide for how to actually take care of themselves. Exactly right. They, they need to have the experience of feeling what's right and what's wrong on an internal level, it comes from within. So there's a sense we have our bodies guide us. They're always there's an intelligence that exists within our bodies. We our job as parents is to guide our children to their own intelligence. And if they don't have that compass, they're going to be lost for for years to come until they understand the intelligence of their own body. So one thing I like to do with my kids is just constantly direct them to like, how's that feel? Like, no, really feel not what do you think about what you did, but check in. How are you feeling? And, you know, good or bad, they know when they feel good, and they know when they feel bad. And this is what we want them to do from a very young age is be in touch with, ah, okay, good, go in that direction, bad, don't do that one again. Don't touch the stove, (laughs) you know, don't, run across the street, they're going to, they need to start to get in touch with that internal compass. And what advice do you have for the parents who are thinking it's too late, their children are too old, habits are too ingrained for that conscious parenting relationship that we're talking about? If they've thought, oh my gosh, I've already raised all of my children, they're all getting ready to go to college, and I haven't done any of this with them. Mm. Well, I don't think it's ever too late. That's just the way I live my life. And I didn't really embody these principles until I was well into my life as a parent. And I see my 17 year old son now living the effects of my unconscious parenting, and then my switch over to conscious parenting, because I sort of did it midway through his life. So I don't think it's ever too late. It's not too late for me to ever change. It's not too late for anyone. It's really just about what am I willing to do and what am I committed to in my life? The show isn't over yet, but I have a request to all of you beautiful mamas. I would love it if you haven't already to go to soulworkformoms.com and join the Soul Work for Moms email list because... Season one of the podcast is going to be wrapping up at the end of June after episode 20. And I want to make sure that you are the first to know when season two premieres at the end of August. During July and August, I'll be putting together the second season of the show. So if you have any requests or suggestions for guests or just for the show itself, send me an email because I would love to hear from you. Also, if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher, whatever app you listen to the show from. And if you really love the podcast, I would love it if you would leave a review of the show so that other mamas can know more of what it's about and why they might want to listen. You can leave a review on iTunes by going to either the podcast app on your phone or to the iTunes store on your computer. You hit search, you type in Soul Work for Moms, then you click on the Soul Work for Moms podcast. And then at the top, there will be a bar that says details, reviews, related. You'll click on reviews and then you click on the link that says write a review. So if you're someone that just does better with visual instructions, you can also go to soulworkformoms.com and type in leave a review into the search bar. And I've got pictures of everything I just said. So to recap, make sure that you are in the Soul Work for Moms community by subscribing to the podcast, by joining the email list on soulworkformoms.com. And as always, you can keep in touch by liking the Soul Work for Moms Facebook page or following along on Instagram at Soul Work for Moms. And this podcast really was created to serve you. So I really look forward to taking this summer to put together season two and any feedback that you have for me that will help Soul Work for Moms serve you better. 
please, please, please don't hesitate to reach out and let me know what can help you best on your journey of motherhood. Now let's get back to the show. And you have a series of conscious parenting classes. And I actually participated in the level one, the foundations course. And I got to say, it's really great. So uh, take a minute and tell us about that. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it was so great to have you participate with me in that course. It was um, a fun course to plan. It's a eight week dive into the principles um, that we put into action to on our daily lives to really understand and wake ourselves up to being conscious in the moment. So every week we explore something that will help wake us up um, and where it is in our life, we can take our lives. We can take full responsibility for waking up. I keep saying that same thing, waking up over and over, but what I've found and what I love about the course is it's a very simple blueprint to where am I awake and where am I asleep? Where am I awake? Where am I asleep? How am I willing to take responsibility? Where am I not willing to take responsibility? And our life is always talking to us. We, we always know what we're delivering by the outcomes we get. So if we're getting disconnection from our kids we can look at how it is we're creating disconnection. There's always, they're always the mirror, constantly the mirror. So what's happening out there is a reflection of what's happening in here. And the eight week course is a guide to leading you towards looking at that and turning the mirror back on yourself over and over again. What kind of things do you guys go over in the course? So week one, we talk about presence, which I believe is the core of it all. Um, in week two, we talk about whether or not you're above the line or below the line. And these are um, all themes that I've taken from Conscious Leadership, the 15 Commitments book that was written by Jim Dethmer and Diana Chapman. And those are my mentors. And I love this framework. So the above the line and the below the line framework is really about whether or not I'm being open to what's going on in the moment or closed. So where am I coming from in this now moment? We talk about how we get into being on the drama triangle. So we get to be in the victim, villain, hero modalities. You know, where do I play victim in relationship to my children? Where do I hero my children? Um, Where am I the villain with my children? And then we get to why, you know, what's under that? Why am I playing that role? How is that familiar? What's it here to teach me about me? We talk about taking responsibility. We talk about getting curious as a means to being conscious or awake. And then we talk about living our lives with candor and true honesty. You teach this class. You also do one-on-one coaching with parents and families. You teach in schools. So you've seen a lot. And I'm curious, what are most mothers struggling with in these areas? Gosh, there's so many things. Um, I think... One of the things we're struggling with is our fear that something somehow is going to go wrong, that our kids are not going to be happy, or we've done, we've done something that isn't going to lead them to success. I think a big thing we struggle with is whether or not our kids are going to be successful. Um, So I think that's a big, big part of what drives us in our parenting, and what in my experience what's occurring is we're getting a little bit wrapped up in entangled with our kids that our kids start to define us rather than our kids are just another being on the planet they that they, they don't actually define who we are or how good a parent we are or how good a person we are they're they're really their own beings so i think our the sense of entanglement is a big one an entanglement in, in what you just described, that our sense of worth is wrapped up in who they are? Yeah. But yeah. somehow if my daughter gets pregnant, that means I somehow did something wrong, that mm-hmm. I'm a bad parent. Yeah. How has this work changed you and your relationship and your family? Oh, it has changed me in so many ways. Um, 
I think what I've most learned is that my children were here to teach me what I'm most capable of. My kids have really shown me my power. They've shown me, they've led me back to my essence, my ability to be compassionate, unconditionally compassionate, my ability to be strong or, you know, tap into my strength, my ability to be patient or my ability to be resilient, um, my ability to be vulnerable. My kids are constantly pointing me to, to vulnerability. <laughs> so this, this idea of like everything that already existed inside me that I had no idea how to really access until they taught me. And what I want to say about that is I could have made the choice to not be open to those things, right? But I, you know, I decided that I didn't want to make that choice. I decided I wanted to explore compassion. So for instance, my youngest child, I, she's my patient child. And what I mean by that is she's so impatient <laughs> that I had no choice but to look at, oh, where is it in my life that I'm, I'm not patient? How is she mirroring for me? Impatience. Oh, so because she's impatient, she gets to represent patience to you. Yes. Okay, got that. So she's wildly impatient and very demanding and, um, you know, highly emotional. And w in the very beginning, when I was first parenting her, I was like, what is wrong with this child? This child, there's something wrong with her. And I, I was looking outside and looking outside and looking for all the reasons to explain why her personality was showing up this way. And it wasn't until I got with, oh, I don't have to fix her. I have to fix me. So when I show up patient around her impatience, suddenly she's becoming more patient. And it's so what, what I was doing is I was reflecting her impatience. She would show up in anxiety and I would reflect anxiety back to her. And then I got with, oh, my strength comes from not being anxious in the, in the face of her anxiety, but really channeling my own patience, my own quiet, my own stillness, my own um, composure. And when I can be that, she can actually look to me, oh, that's what it looks like. I need to do that. How do I do that? Show me, show me, show me. And it isn't a guidebook. I'm not telling her how to be it. I'm actually holding the state for her so that it's a mirror so that she can mimic me. Make sense? Yeah, that makes total sense. I love it. Do they ever call you out? Like you're the parenting coach because I've um, heard other people who work with children and that they've said that their kids are like, you're supposed to know what you're doing. You know, you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Well, I have two funny stories. One is right before the summit in October, which you said you, you came to, I was in a little bit of a frenzy and trying to get all these things done. And um, I wasn't super attuned to Ashley in particular and I'm making dinner and pulling things together. And it, I was a little anxious and stressed. And she kept asking me, you know, help me with this, help me with this. And I said, not now, not now. And I kept pushing her off. And um, she yelled at me and then I yelled back. And she pounds her fists on the table and she goes, you're not a conscious parent. I don't know who you think you are throwing this summit. You know, it was just really funny. And I just burst out laughing. I go, yep, in this moment, I am so not conscious. <laughs> they are total truth tellers, aren't they? They're, yeah, truth yeah. serum 101. But yeah. and the other quick story I have is, my son, my 17 year old son just came back from junior retreat where they had all this deep diving and, you know, they facilitated workshops with the kids. And, um, he said, the facilitator said to him, wow, like you're really, you know, in touch with yourself. And, you know, she was impressed with how he showed up and he goes, I, and my mom makes me do this all the time. She's a coach. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Holding his head in shame. Like, yeah, yeah, I, would exactly. do this yeah I get it. I have no choice. <laughs> oh, that's funny. How did you get into this work? I don't remember how I actually started other than I sort of always knew that this is the world that I play in. I wasn't sure what form it would take. Early in my 20s, I got into interior design. Hmm. And I 
knew that I wanted to be in that field for a while because it was really fun. And as I got deeper into that work, I thought, wow, this is really fun designing people's outside world, but I'm much more interested in the inside world of people. And interior design is actually really psychological because you're expressing yourself uh, um, in your home, right? Your clothes express you, your furniture expresses who you are inside. But I was much more interested in getting inside people. So I started coaching and working with people who were going through divorce because I was going through divorce at the time and I just really started loving the work and it just grew and grew from there. Cool. Um, We're going to start moving on to some questions about you and motherhood specifically, Um, but I wanted to make sure that I asked a Facebook listener. She said that she's curious on your take on how grandmothers can be conscious grandparents and have a positive and significant role in their grandchild's life without undermining their own children? The parent, the actual parent. Hmm. Wow, that's a good one. Ooh, that brings up all my stuff. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would answer it almost in the same way that I answered about parenting. It's this idea of showing up in unconditional love. And in a way, I think it's a little bit easier as a grandparent because you're, you know, one degree of separation, not Mm -hmm. as attached to um, the outcome of the child. What I think is important is to get clear as the grandparent, um, how you feel about the parent who's parenting that child. Mm. So be careful not to let any judgments about how your daughter in this case is parenting um, show up in the way you're in relationship to the grandchild. So for instance, if you think, you know, we'll we'll take a teenage girl, for instance, and a mom is letting her teenage girl get a tattoo and the grandparent thinks the mom is too um, permissive. Yeah. Permissive. And so she's coming from a place of judgment about the, the, the parent doing that really being clear that it has nothing to do with your relationship with the grandchild. And sometimes that can come out as judgment for the grandchild or in relationship to that grandchild. It really, Michelle, the answer is unconditional love. It's always coming down to unconditional love. And how can I show up in the life of these people in the most uh, um, unconditional loving place in the place of deep compassion and deep vulnerability. So that same unconditional love that you want to have for your grandchildren, have it for your grandchildren's parents as well. And that is serving then the grandchildren also. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. And really, I think one of the things our grandparents can do that to best support our grandchildren is to support the parent to really like love the parent allow them to make mistakes. I know hindsight is, you know, what's that expression? Hindsight Hindsight is 2020. Yeah. I was going to say 40, 40. I'm like, that's some kind of vision. (laughs) That's extra credit. Yeah, (laughs) (laughs) Extra credit. But I I think modeling that relationship and modeling respect for the parent is um, fundamental for the relationship between grandchild and grandparent. Mm -hmm. So you and your partner, you together have five children. Did you always know that you wanted to be a mom? Oh, yeah. From the moment I could utter the words mother, I always knew it. Yeah. Okay. And then once you did become a mom, um, what was most surprising to you? What was most surprising to me was how hard it is, how hard it is to be a parent it's just heart wrenching every moment of every day and beautiful, simultaneously beautiful. Right. Um, and how much love you could possibly have for another human being. The amount of love that exists is, is magnanimous. It's yeah, it's amazing. Breathtaking. What is something that you either struggled with before the work or even still struggle with to this day in mothering? Yeah, this is such a great question. Um, I think there's so many things that I've struggled with over the years. The one that I seem to be getting better at is this idea of letting go. It was very hard early on. I wanted to control everything. I wanted it to be perfect. I wanted 
it to be right. You know, I had this vision of what parenting was. I had this vision of the way I wanted my kids to show up in the world. And I thought there was some perfect outcome. And if you followed the specific formula, it would be foolproof, you know? Yeah. And I was the only fool in that whole theory. <laughs> so, yeah, letting go and, and allowing and acceptance, all of these things were the things that I struggled with. And, you know, I get better and better with every day. And the more I let go, the more I fall into acceptance, the more at ease I am. Yeah. It feels good. And how do you take care of yourself? Mm. So for me, it's, it's simple. And I don't always take care of myself. That's okay. the first time good I say point. I don't. <laughs> um, what I know, the formula that I know that works for me is really simple. Yoga, regular yoga med, um, practice, um, regular meditation practice, for me, sleep is key. I got to have my sleep. Mm-hmm, me too. Uh, yeah. And nurturing relationships are really important to me. Um, and sometimes snugly up and watching bad reality TV. <laughs> it's like, it, yeah, that, that my formula varies. But for the most part, I got to have my yoga. I got to have my meditation. I got to have my sleep. Okay. And um, how would you say, I think you've really answered this, but how have, has being a mother changed you? Mm. Yeah, I think that going back to what we talked about earlier is it's, cha- it's empowered me in a way that I forgot was true for me. So I say it that way because we're all born into self-empowerment. And as, as we grow, we forget about our power. And my kids just brought me back to my own power and that my power comes from this like pool of unconditional love, which is filled with compassion and strength and patience and resilience and vulnerability and kindness and all of those, you know, qualities that, 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 um, are in that pool of unconditional love. So I think that's really how it's changed me. It's given me power from this really beautiful place. Cool. And we are going to start wrapping up. We've got two questions left, though. And the Mm -hmm. first one is, what do you want your children to remember about childhood? Mm. Yeah, um, this is going to sound kind of (laughs) hokey. But, uh, you know, the one thing I truly want them to remember is home is where the heart is. And you know, it reminds me of like a needlework pillow <laughs> that you see on like some Victorian sofa. But really, like you can come back home and, and, and home is really the source of unconditional love, the source of home, this beingness in your center, in your core. And I want their childhood to be a reminder to, you know, me showing him, showing them like that, taking them back there all the time. And that's why I called you know, that's why my, my business is called bring it home. It's always bringing it back home to the core, to the center, to your being, to your heart, to the truth of who you really are. So, you know, what I want them to remember about childhood is home is where the heart is. Home is where the love is that this is a fun, safe, great place to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And last question, what is the one thing that you want all mothers to know? Hmm. I love this question. Um, I think that the greatest gift that you can give your kids is to learn to trust yourself. And if all mothers can learn to trust themselves and that you have your own intelligence, that there's nothing like the power of your own intelligence and there's nobody out there. There's no book. There's no class. There's nothing outside you that can gift you this attunement to yourself other than you. I think that's, that's the thing I want mothers to remember that your greatest gift you can give yourself is trusting yourself and trusting your own inner knowing. And I say that because I think we get really scared when we start to parent and we we start to read all the books and we think the experts have the answers. 
And really the experts just lives within you. That's so great. And Marie, thank you so much for coming on the show today, for sharing your journey, for sharing your wisdom with us. I really appreciate it. And if someone would like to get in touch with you, how can they find you? They can find me at bringithome.me on the internet, or feel free to reach out to me at Marie at bringithome.me via email. Of course, Facebook, Bring It Home. And Twitter, once again, bring it home. So we're always bringing it back home. You can also find those show links in the show notes on soulworkformoms.com. I don't know about you, but I feel much more clear now on what it means to be present and conscious with our children. Thanks to Anne-Marie for breaking it down so well for us. If you are listening to this on Monday, May 9th, Anne-Marie is hosting a free anger webinar tomorrow. Learn how to mindfully harness and express the power of anger and walk away equipped to support your child in navigating their anger as well. As I said, this webinar is tomorrow, Tuesday, May 10th. Go to soulworkformoms.com to get the link and register. You can also find the links on the Soul Work for Moms Facebook page, so make sure that you've liked that. If you're listening to this episode after Monday or Tuesday, make sure that you're subscribed to the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you're listening from so that you get each episode as it goes live and you won't miss a thing. This week's soul work action step is this. Try for just one moment of total presence with your children this week. See if you can show up and have an interaction with your child, letting them be who they are so that you can fully connect with them. See if you can drop the story of what their behavior or words trigger for you and see if you can connect with just one conversation where you're really letting them be who they are in the moment without trying to manipulate them or the situation. If you'd like to go deeper into your soul work, fill out the soul worksheet from today's show. Again, that's found at soulworkformoms.com. Be sure and listen to next week's episode. It's one you won't want to miss. We'll be hearing from the author of A Mother's Manual for Self-Care, Michelle Schrag. You'll hear about Michelle's unique perspective on self-care, which is centered around getting rid of false beliefs. You'll also hear me ask Michelle what the biggest difference for her is in raising teens and tweens versus raising younger children. And make sure that you send your feedback for the show to michelle at soulworkformoms.com. That's Michelle with two L's. I'd really love to hear from you what you love, what you'd like to see change, how this show can better serve you. And I'll end today as always by reminding you that you matter. What you do as a mother has the unique capacity to change the world. And that is evolution through mothering. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next week.